Colin Mullen and uh, work in film and work as youth art facilitator. Well, my name is Kim Doherty. I'm an art therapist and a visual artist. Um, and I'm involved in a lot of arts and health projects. Um, so where artists collaborate. Hi, I'm Heather Brett. I'm a poet and an artist. And I sometimes work with Kim, which is great because it's another side of um, the art therapy. And I do a lot of facilitation too with young people and older people. I'm Maura Donald, and um, I'm a textile artist and I facilitate workshops with all ages. Um, like you're saying, it's been great to work with Kim and to work with Carla and hopefully work with more Calvin Arts facilitators in the future. I'm Carla and and um, I multidiscipline. I work uh, mainly with music, art and drama. My name is Trina McCann. I'm an actor and drama facilitator. Um, I work mainly with young people facilitating youth drama groups around Cavan and Monaghan. And I work with adults also. My name is Elke Weston. I can only follow on, on, up from, from you there. Um, I'm a glass designer, Master of Art. My work mainly involves working with architecture uh, in health settings as well as in educational settings and uh, other public buildings. As artists, there's a, no matter how collaborative the work is, there's always a time when you're really in a solitary area of development. You know, because we do collaborate, but whatever your field is, that you are on your own with that until the point that it opens up to start to yes. develop with other people. We were essentially on our own, especially if you lived alone. Mm. Um, and in some ways, I think artists understood that a bit more, or maybe um, we were used to dealing with the blank page, but to connect with other artists and to connect with other people in general, it's been really good to connect with others through the, through the peer network. And I suppose the second aspect of it, for me, that was important is when you connect out to other groups, in a way you're advocating for the arts because you're wanting other people to experience the resource that you have or the the positive um the positive aspects that it can provide for you, you know, stepping into someone else's shoes through the arts. Sometimes you feel quite quite lonely in your work and in the end we all came very good together after the first meeting. And I think for an artist it's you always have the uh loneliness just mm. as in mm -hmm. it's a um, to find new ideas or to find the perfect or the right idea for the setting, like for me, for the architecture. And then it, it uh, develops, the whole, the whole idea develops into uh, something that can be developed with different people or with, with uh, the client or with the architects or whoever is in, involved later on or with the user of the, of the buildings. And to get the connection between being really, really lonely, alone, finding the, the right idea or finding the starting point for your artwork and then coming out there in between. There's always a connection to be made there. I think when I look back on it now, um, it was kind of a, I don't know, some kind of saving grace because, you know, we were all alone and we knew we were going to be alone and all of that there, but then we had this other, this other realm to go to where everybody was on Zoom, you know. And yeah, I think it was, it was, it actually worked for a lot of us. I would have facilitated and worked with mm. loads of people, but as an artist, I was alone, you know. But the peer network actually expanded me there. I, I got to do all you shared your wonderful artistry and I got to, to experience it and practice it and expand what I do as well. So it was amazing, yeah. So it went from being solitary, but through the Zoom, becoming a, a community. It was brilliant. For me, it was... It was kind of like um, my own little time and space to tap into my own creat creativity because I think when you're a facilitator, you concentrate so much on your group, on your members, your young people or the group that you're working with that you kind of forget about yourself. Mm. So for me, it was, I don't like calling it selfish time, but it kind of was my time um, and I was allowed to be the participant and I got to tap into different parts of my creativity that I wouldn't normally because I don't normally you know, do visual arts or I wouldn't normally do, you know, maybe mindfulness or whatever it was we were doing on that day. Um, 
And then that then helped me going forward with my projects or whatever I was doing uh, to think about things in a different way or to approach things in a different way. So I felt that it it helped me, I suppose, not become bored of, of my own process, which I think can can happen a lot. There was a great deal of trust. Yes. Um, you mentioned openness, and I think you can't yes. be open unless you have trust. Mm. So I think the fact that we didn't have to have an outcome allowed us mm. to just have an experience. Yeah, I would agree. There was so much richness from it. You know, there was the richness of seeing everyone else's art because we all took a turn of facilitating. You could see the way that other people facilitated, and you could learn from that. And Although it can be intimidating to facilitate something to your peers, everyone was so supportive and you got some feedback maybe on what worked and what didn't work, which is really useful to come from your peers who are also facilitating. That's really valuable. Um, and then the richness of just all those different media. Um, yeah, and then also the richness in the sharing, because as you say, we were also, we felt safe in that space. Um, I know if I was in the room, I closed the door, so it was a, no one else in the house was hearing what we were talking about. So you could create a really safe space. And I was surprised how much, you know, we're all together in the room here, our energies mixing and flowing, but it seemed to work on the Zoom as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the things I really remember was getting really focused in on what we were doing in the periods where we would just create something ourselves and then come back together, that you would every so often you'd hear someone's pencil on the page or them cleaning their brush and hitting it off the side of the jam jar and those little sounds made you feel like you're in a little studio space with other artists mm. and that was really that really helped me in my loneliness and my in my creative process and made me feel less alone and much more connected to the other artists yeah i think we were lucky that we had a language almost to communicate but i think yeah. the art form provides us with mm. another language like another means to communicate mm. Um, because you get to have the experience collectively, but you're also having that experience for yourself. It was a very non-judgmental space. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I think as artists, we're so used to being judged what you do, how you earn money, why you do it, you know. Um, so to go into a, a safe space where you know no one's judging you is something quite special mm-hmm. that you don't get often. Mm-hmm. And also the fact that you were in your own space, you could choose to share or not to share, you could keep what you'd made completely out of sight of anybody if you wanted. So then the sharing was really about you choosing to share and not anyone looking over the shoulder, your shoulder at what you were doing. So there was a real power within that, I suppose, for the individual. If they chose to share the image or the experience or not, everyone was free to do that. I think that was really important to this, the safety aspect and the trust. You could expose what you wanted in an honest way, an mm. unneighbored way, but no one has to see it. So there was an honesty and a vulnerability that was there that I think was it was important not to share it, you know, not to record it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I think I, th- I think the, the main thing then was loneliness and that was very apparent, like, you know, at mm-hmm. the beginning. Yeah. Because, you know, your whole, your whole world had been upset, you know, and you didn't have the same freedom. And even in the way we love solitude for our art, it was a different thing completely. And there's a difference between... Um, you know, self-imposed solitude yeah. and imposed mm. solitude. Absolutely. And that's what we were all dealing with. And the uncertainty, I think that was the ground was shifting under our feet all the time. So we were mm-hmm. kind of looking for an anchor mm-hmm. in some some form, whether it was each other or the practice or own practice or mm-hmm. or just being tended to in a way. It was very nurturing. We were all tending to each other mm-hmm. in a way into our own mm-hmm. mental, physical, emotional health as we were facilitating, you know. So you mm-hmm. felt... As you were saying, it was it maybe it wasn't selfish. I would call it nurturing time. Mm-hmm. You know, it was the filling up the well and, and feeding yourself, so that you were ready to go back out into the world and, and deal with all this stuff that was going on. Part of the conversation that we're here to talk about is, is, is well-being and how the arts is part of your life. It's interesting just when I think about it because I, I started questioning that how much of the arts pro- processes that I've done before are. The well-being is because of the distraction of doing the art. Mm-hmm. Sometimes the doing itself is a distraction from something else, but it's still pleasurable, but it's... Mm-hmm. Yeah, know, that's interesting. Yeah, it is, because yeah. I never thought about it before, and I thought, okay, well, then when I actually did the thing with the light, then I thought, okay, well, that's not for anything. That's purely immersive mm-hmm. in, in, in practice, in your own thing, rather than 
distracted. Before I ever got involved in, in facilitating mm. or re- studying the arts, I, I, I played the piano or, mm. and I'd write songs and mm. I'd go in, I could be in an awful state, in an awful state and I'd go in solitary into my room, start playing that piano, start writing lyrics mm. and I'd come out a new person. I've always felt there's like a cre- everyone has a creative energy in them, but for me personally, if I don't use that energy to create, it starts to turn inward and become self-destructive. So the first thing I have to do is start to do something, do anything. And like even at the very beginning of lockdown, when everyone was really frightened, I got a mandala colouring book out and I started colouring in. And I'm thinking, this is what I did when I was five or six or seven <laughs> years old. And I, you know, as an artist, what am I doing? You know, why am I doing this? But I couldn't. I didn't have the capacity to create anything new. All I could do was choose a colour, choose another colour, choose another colour, and that would calm me down enough to to get on with my day. Um, And I think it was interesting what you're saying about distance. The thing that the analogy that I think of is it's like a river, so there's that flow of creativity, and you can be in the river and be in that flow, but then you can choose to climb out and stand on the bridge and look down at the water, Mm. and that's when you're reflecting on what you've created. And then you can start to see the connections or the layers of meaning that are in there or what the emotion was. And you can say, oh, suddenly, OK, that makes sense. Now I can I can think of that in a different way and that makes it acceptable. It makes it something you can live with now. Um, and I would have used poetry and, and, and touched on in that way to process stuff where I, I thought I was going to start to make one thing and something else completely came out. And then I've, I've been able to look at it and say, this is what's really happening inside, you know, because there's a swirling of emotions that are very hard to pin down. But when you get it on the page or you get it, you know, on screen or in a photograph or whatever it is, you can suddenly see it objectively and maybe start to unpick it and make sense of it. That's how it supports me. I think time did slow down, like, you know, yeah. and, and, and the detail became important in lots of ways, mm-hmm. you know, that things that we wouldn't have normally um, but because of the nurturing and because of the well-being and even even all the ideas of, of a healthy mental health or nurturing or whatever we needed, um, I think we got time to have a better look at it. Mm-hmm. You know, when, when the small things did become important, and they're still important, which is a nice thing mm-hmm. that we got out of that. So I did a lot of work that I don't need access to the studio to. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've been working with architecture. There was another um, downturn of the whole thing because most of the building sites were closed in between as well. So there was another aspect of not happening, not being able to to work. Mm. And you were not allowed to uh, go to the studio Mm. and just do things. Physically, do your product, do your art. Yeah. And that was not there anymore. And, And this process of feeling good while painting or while doing a product or while filming just yeah. taking you on there. I think that was just missing apart from not being able to, to earn money but um, the whole process of feeling well doing your artwork or doing works of art was gone. Mm. And suddenly you were realizing how important it is to do that work for yourself and for your well-being. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I suppose it depends on your art form. Mm-hmm. Yes, if, yeah. if, if you don't have access to the tools you need or the equipment or yeah. the environment or whatever that is, you're, you're not benefiting then from that mm-hmm. time. I think we all, from working with the old people and through the arts and well-being, um, you see you think it's very tangible, the, ben- the benefits mm-hmm. of working with arts. And but I like, and especially during this whole time, like people, like friends or young people that I know that do, would not really have much engagement with arts. I've noticed that you can see the difficulties in having a mechanism to cope with things. Mm-hmm. I've noticed it more so. You say, I suppose, we're looking at distractions where mm-hmm. before you would have a multitude of distractions mm-hmm. going out or this, that, and the other. And those are taken away, and there isn't a, a thing. You do see the cracks forming. Um, because I often wonder then if I if I had no outlet, what person would I be? Sometimes you know, <laughs> and, you know how many cracks would I have? Yeah. It's interesting dealing with challenging things or so on. I find you can really throw yourself into those ideas. Sometimes they would be maybe terrifying to go down, 
mm-hmm. if I didn't have a, a purpose for it, let's say. It's true for me too, mm-hmm. that when you work with other people, you're generally thinking about how you work with other people, but you're not you're not necessarily remember the, remembering the artist that's in you that mm-hmm. needs to be fed mm-hmm. or needs to be nurtured. Mm-hmm as you would say more I like, mm-hmm. um, yeah. so the connecting actually helps I find life is important now you know or find maybe our attitude to everything that works is better I think a lot of our art has become um, whether intentional or not has become very therapeutic over the COVID period um, for me I wouldn't have thought of um, my art as being therapeutic or involved in any way as wellness until it was taken away from me and then I realized very much so that it is wellness and it's wellness as much for the young people as it is for me. And when something that you enjoy and you get enjoyment out of is taken away from you, something from you is missing, something from you is lacking. So I think for me anyway, um, the last 18 months ha- has made me realize how much my art is connected to wellness and well-being.